The game library of the Atari 7800 is probably the least documented on YouTube. Because of that, I've decided it's the perfect console to try to conquer the library of. The library might be small, but these games are undocumented and difficult. Join us as one man tries to beat the Atari 7800 library. So hey guys, this is the 7800 Pro Gamer, a.k.a. Silverback, a.k.a. John. And thanks for joining us for episode 3 of Man vs. 7800, where I beat every 7800 game I can get my hands on. So this time we're going for Double Dragon, which is a game that is not highly regarded especially compared to the arcade game, the NES version, even the Sega Master System version. I've heard a lot of people say that this one is very hard, they can't get past the first few screens, it's unplayable, but it's a game that demands that you learn how to play it. Uh, other D Double Dragon games or other versions of Double Dragon, you can go up to opponents, do whatever moves you want, and have some success. Other moves are better than others, of course. Famously, the back elbow smash in the arcade game was your go-to. But in this game, things work a little bit differently. They kind of had to do some things that maybe you wouldn't expect them to do. And I'm not sure that they had to do it, but it's how they chose to do it, I should say. So in this game, uh, I'll talk about the development team in a minute. And this is one of the rare examples where... There are scrolling credits at the end, and if you wait at the menu long enough, you'll see the entire staff. And we'll discuss who was on here, because there's some really talented people that worked on this game, believe it or not. But this is a game that you have to learn how to play, and to do that, you have to know what the opponents are doing. The opponents essentially have two states of being. So they are in what I call attack mode and wander mode, where they kind of wander around the screen. Attack mode, you can tell if they're in attack mode by moving up and down on the screen and seeing if they stay consistent with what plane you're on. So they'll try to match uh, across from you the best that they can. If you see that, you don't have much of a hope in hitting them with anything really besides a jumping back kick, and you'll, you'll really have to depend on that in order to beat this game. So attack mode, you are really limited on what you can do against the opponents, and while it doesn't make for a really fun game, it does help you conquer the game once you become aware of that, that certain state of being that your enemies get into. The wonder mode, you can tell that they're in that, by changing your plane again moving up and down and seeing if they try to match where you're at on the screen if they don't and they continue progressing in whatever direction they were walking then you know they're wandering around basically trying to get behind you usually is what they want to do when they're in wander mode you can hit them with any attack you want i do not recommend the punches because you'll end up trading blows with them and you'll lose a lot of unnecessary health but you could do a jump kick a back smash elbow a headbutt whatever you want to them when they're in this state because they don't take the initiative to attack you and here we get to the first boss which is a bobo and a just a normal enemy We'll see quite a bit of a Bobo here, and I, I kind of do like the way he looks in this game. But in Wander Mode, you can do whatever moves you want. You can get kind of creative with your move set. But you'll see me using the Jumping Back Kick and the Jump Kick a lot in, in combination with each other. That's usually the best method i found of taking out enemies quickly. And it's something that you'll just have to get used to. The The controls in this game are actually pretty good once you get to know them. I know a lot of people complain about this game in general and, and about the controls. But I think they work well with what they, they had to work with here. Uh, Bobo there, he, he wasn't difficult to take out. But there's a few of Bobo battles that get really, really tough. So... That is sort of how you play the game. If you get a weapon, you can be a lot more aggressive. But 
you got to play defensive in this game about 90% of the time. If you want to make it anywhere, you have to know what your opponents are doing and do a lot of jumping back kicks, honestly. And there's a lot of areas, if you can get yourself in the corner, the bottom, usually lower left of the screen is what I like, you can just basically beat them down no problem. But there's a lot of screens where you'll fall off the, the bottom of the screen. So you, you have to kind of just get used to doing the, the jumping back kick whilst having to move around the, the map a little bit. It's not the easiest thing to do. So, getting into Double Dragon a little bit more here. On the 7800, as I said, there's a credit scroll for all the people that worked on the game, which is very rare for 7800 games, or really any game at this time. Um, so we know the staff of about 10 or so people that worked on the game. I'll go over them quickly here, and then we'll get into some of them and what games they ended up doing later in life. The director of the game was Alex DeMio. The programmer was Tommy Hahn. The artwork was done by Jess, Jesse Capilli. Uh, additional programming was done by Alex DeMio. The audio was done by Alex DeMio. The producer was Perry Rogers. The testers were Steve Imes, Gary Barth, and Mike Norton. Product management was John Crompton. And then Hunter Cohn is credited with a player's guide, I guess. So this team was Imagineering Incorpor Incorporated. So the game has Activision, and this is one of the few Abobo, the one of the few battles without a Bobo as the boss. You can tell by the music when you reach the boss there. Uh, this boss is just a little bit harder of an average enemy that you'll encounter more late into the game. But getting back to the people that worked on the game, Imagineering was the company that actually did the programming, an American company in New Jersey. And Activision, basically, you know, they were the publisher of the game. So Alex DeMeo, he went on to work on about 36 games, or at least he, have, he has credits in 36 games, um, in various areas such as production and design and programming and engineering and audio. Really, he's done a lot of stuff in the video game industry. Um, some of the things that I find more impressive on his resume, um, he obviously did this port of Double Dragon. He did the 7800 port of Ikiri Warriors, um, doing the sound in that game. He um, worked on Simpsons, Bart vs. the Space Mutants for the NES. He did the audio in that game. Um, for... Programming, he did the Atari 5200 version of Keystone Capers. He did the adaption of that game. He was the programmer on Pete Rose Baseball. He did uh, programming on Ghostbusters 2 for the NES, Home Alone 2 for the NES. Um, moving on to some of his design credits, he did a lot of the Home Alone ports and the Home Alone 2 ports. Um, that's for SNES. Um, Genesis, all that stuff. He uh, worked on a lot of games through the 90s, a lot of Genesis and SNES games, and uh, a lot of licensed stuff. Like I said, he had Home Alone listed. He worked on Barbie, s several Simpsons games. So he had a, a good career in the 90s. Uh, Tommy Hahn is somebody who didn't work on much. He only worked on two games as far as I could find. Double Dragon as the programmer, and I carry Warriors for the 7800 as a programmer. So I, I don't know what he went on to do after this, but I gotta say that while this game plays strange, it's it's kind of a weird game to play, especially once you understand it. It's, it, it's not what you would expect. But I carry Warriors, on the other hand, plays really good on the 7800, so he... I feel like he, he knew what he was doing, and he could have went on to do more, but I, he got away from video games after working on those two 7800 titles. Um, moving on, we have Jesse Capilli. I'm, I'm not sure of their orientation, so we'll just call them them. Um, Jesse worked on a few games. He uh, 
they have uh, 29 credits. They did this game, obviously. Spy Hunter as a graphics artist for the ColecoVision. The Commodore version of Crossbow doing that artwork. They did um, Ghostbusters 2 graphics for the NES. Uh, Boy and His Blob for the NES. They did the graphics for that. Simpsons vs. Bart vs. the Space Mutants. They did the graphics for... RC Grand Prix for the Game Boy, they did the graphics. Ghoul School for the, uh, I believe, I thought that was Super Nintendo, but it's listed here as NES. And uh, essentially ended up doing games like Nicktoons Racing for the GameCube and ATV Quad Frenzy for the Nintendo Wii. All his credits, or all their credits, I'm sorry, were in the art department. So that, again, they went on to have a very fruitful, uh, long-lasting career. So moving on to Perry Rogers, who was the producer on this game, worked on a whopping 62 games. And I'm just going to name off a few titles. I'm not going to get too deep into them. I just want to rattle them off real quick. See if you recognize any of these. Mortal Kombat 3, PlayStation. Project Horned Owl, PlayStation. Ghostbusters 2, Game Boy. Thunderbirds NES. I keep I'm gonna keep going here. Tobal number one PlayStation. Cool Borders PlayStation. Parappa the Rapper PlayStation. Final Fantasy VII PlayStation. Intelligent Cube PlayStation. Tomba PlayStation. Spyro the Dragon. Medieval. Ape Escape. Hot Shots Golf 2. Uh, the the list just goes on. So. All his credits are as a producer, senior producer, executive producer. And I thought Final Fantasy VII was a weird credit, but what it was is he went on to work for the SCEA, or Sony Computer Entertainment of America, as a senior producer. So he was involved with a lot of those PlayStation games, such as Final Fantasy VII and, and Bushido Blade and a lot of Square properties, uh, including you know Gran Turismo, which isn't a Square property but a lot of really popular PlayStation games. So it sounds like after the Japanese companies did the programming, he was involved in a lot of whatever Sony Com uh, Computer Entertainment of America did, uh, usually on the publishing side, I believe. But whatever a producer does, he did it for Sony for quite a while. And I thought that was really cool that a guy that did Double Dragon for the Atari 7800 went on to work on some of the greatest PlayStation games of all time. I mean, how awesome is that? So a few of these other guys, uh, not to leave them out, Steve Imes, who was a product tester, went on to basically do a lot of testing for a few years of his career, uh, mostly testing credits again. He did a few producing credits, but things like Wing Commander 3, Scud Disposable Assassin, uh, Lost Files of Sherlock Holmes, Normie's Beach Babe Rama, uh, Madden NFL 94, PGA Tour Golf, Road Rash 2 for the Genesis. Uh, went on to do a lot of game testing, so if if uh, you played any of those games and you think they play well, that's that's thanks to him. Now, 112 credits for Gary Barth, who did game testing for this as well. Uh, he was involved in a lot of Sony computer entertainment games, and he seemed to have stayed in the industry a lot longer because he has credits such as God of War, Ratchet & Clank, Twisted Metal, SOCOM, uh, again, the Uncharted series, the Raiden Project in 95, uh, and a lot of these are creative director, uh, design team, senior manager, producer, so it, it seems like Gary Barth started out doing testing and really moved up in life in the, uh, again, Sony Computer Entertainment of America. And they have credits right up to 2018's God of War as a senior manager. So Gary Barth really did well for himself. And uh, he's somebody, I'd like to reach out to some of these guys that are still in the industry and s see how much the 7800 really did for them or if they remember their time working on it and to go over mike norton real quick did uh was the last play tester 
Uh, not a whole lot that I'm familiar with here, but the last two games that uh, Mike Norton worked on was DC Universe Online as a comic artist and did additional art for 007 Tomorrow Never Dies on uh, the PlayStation. So, uh, worked on a few games Mike Norton did, but that team went on to do a lot of really good games and a lot of incredible things, so I'm I'm really surprised at the pedigree here. I imagine that this was an early effort for a lot of them at Imagineering, and it's kind of neat that they went on to produce games like the new God of War reboot and uh, Ratchet and & Clank and Final Fantasy VII, and a lot of the greatest games in the industry or what people consider to be the greatest games in the industry, they had hands in. So, if you think the 7800 is a bad game and the people that made it were a bunch of nobodies and a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing, well, maybe they didn't at the time, but they went on to know what they were doing. So, as you can see, we're at the final level here. Um, if you played the NES version, you're used to these walls pushing you off and the spear guys that will stab you and stuff. You don't have none of that in this version. Um, it's generally just the enemies. You have the one spot of platforming where I, I kind of cheated and went in the grass above the bridge. But generally not too much platforming in here and it stayed pretty true to the arcade version. Uh, especially over the NES version. Um... So here we're going to make our way to Marion and hopefully rescue her. I haven't beaten this game too many times, so it's always a treat when uh, I play it and I make it to the, the final boss and, and actually beat him, because he is pretty difficult here. So, not a lot of variety in, in the, the character sprites and stuff. And while everything looks okay, I always thought that, you know, that your player character, I think Jimmy Lee, he looks like he has breasts to me, and I, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it just looks kind of odd. And I know a lot of people would say, well, it's the 7800, that's probably the best they could do. But look up Kevin Moss's uh, sprite hack of this game. And it, it worked on a legit cartridge. I think No Swear Gamer has it and showed it off. He got some really good looking graphics. So I think it could have been done a little nicer. But I'm sure as with everything else, Atari 7800, maybe they're on a tight deadline. And wanted to get the game out as quickly as possible. So I won't hold the graphics against them too much. But I, I really would have liked to have seen... A little bit better sprites here, but I do like the back. I think they did a great job on the backgrounds, and, and I think a Bobo looks great. I really like the way he looks in this game. Um, one thing, this is one of the few 7800 games that employs bank switching. So bank switching is something that became big on like the NES and stuff, and I'm not a real technical guy, so if I get this wrong, correct me in the comments, but bank switching basically lets you get more out of your cartridge, more out of the memory, and allows you to produce larger games with, you know, more levels and characters and just things involved in it. So, here we finally made it to the last room. We're going to rescue Marion if we can. First, you got to go through quite a few tough enemies here. And this is something that, again, I, I've lost a lot of lives here. Generally, if I don't have two lives when I get here, it's, it's pretty much impossible for me to do. But luckily, you can hang out in this bottom corner. And if you get a good rhythm, um, you can usually beat up all these guys. But... You can see there my controller kind of messed up and did a normal kick and got out of rhythm. And then I let Bobo get too close there and got ganged up on. But yeah, the, the bank switching thing. So, ideally, if the 7800 had been more popular and more people had worked on it, 
bank switching could have became a big thing and a lot more you know like complicated games could have been produced for the 7800 just like the NES and it's something that certainly was possible and people have theorized that tricks like that would have been employed a lot the 7800 had you know maybe been more successful or in Warner's hands or whatnot GCC's hands but here we finally made it to Machine Gun Willie and the thing with him you want to keep him in wander mode as much as possible because he doesn't have to get right up on you to hit you so if, if he's in attack mode he will just sit there and spray you with bullets and it makes it very hard to beat him and most times sometimes you can get him stuck in the corner there and you can beat up on him I've done that before I don't know how to make it happen consistently but what you want to do is keep him in wander mode as much as possible because when he gets in attack mode, he'll stand back and he will shoot the heck out of you. Uh, the other thing here is you technically don't have to beat these other guys. If you beat Machine Gun Willie, you beat the game. So if you want to focus in on him, that's a strategy too. But You can see here we're getting beat and we finally beat Machine Gun Willie. We rescue Marion. We did it. We beat Double Dragon for the 7800. It's it's a fun game once you learn to play by its rules, but that's the thing. You have to play by its rules. So that's three games down as we see a rare credit screen for a 7800 game. We beat three games. We got Midnight Mutants done, Tower Toppler done, and now Double Dragon for the 7800. So stay tuned. I'm going to get into a homebrew game next. One that features dragons actually so there's a little hint for you and i'll see you on the next one thank you so much for listening and don't forget to like comment and subscribe all that youtube stuff take it easy guys